All right. So as you all um, come into the space, I, I invite you all to, um, again, still share in the chat, um, you know, your name, where you hail from, and a seat that has some cultural or spiritual significance to you. And I think we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to start, before introducing our uh, panel, I'm going to start by opening with a poem um, that was written by one of our panelists, Mr. Gordon Reed, Uncle Gordon. Um, and so um, he shared this wonderful uh, poem with us today. And it reads, the plant, excuse me, <laughs> it's the, the poem is called The Seed. And um, it reads, plant the seeds of indifference, of pride, of hate, of war, of luck, of wisdom, of life, of hope, of joy, of faith, of dis disconnect, disconnect, sorry, <laughs> um, dissonant, of chance, of reason, of loss, of peace, of doom, of fate, of fear, of revenge, of rebellion, of despair, of repentance, of knowledge, of love, of change, and you will find what bounty, bounty shall men harvest when one plants. These of seeds of the mind, how can there be a sweet fragrance from these? That time has sown from its fertile resting place, it blooms for all to see. For that the many growing things, all life of new, starts as but a seed. Thank you for those words, Gordon. Thank you. All right. So again, everyone, welcome into the space. And um, I'm so grateful to introduce this amazing group of Black Seed Stewards. And even more thrilled that this conversation lands during Black History Month. Black History Month is a time to celebrate and commemorate the roles of African, the roles African Americans have played throughout the history of our country. Seed has played an important role in African American history from the time that our ancestors were forcibly transported from Africa, who braided rice seeds into their hair as a means for survival of themselves and the culture of their homeland. There is no seed history without African American seed stewards. And so with that, I would like to um, begin by introducing our panel panelists. Um, we have uh, with us today, Gordon Reed, who uh, refers to, who is referred to as Uncle Gordon. And he started growing food and plants back in 1958 due to an illness. And his doctor at the time prescribed several native and wild plants to treat the ailment. Um, he then started digging in the soil, growing, collecting and foraging plants and seeds ever since. He believes that the best medicine on earth is fresh, healthy foods. Gordon has over 50 years of experience as a small farmer and in the urban and growing environments. He is the co-founder of Farms to Grow Inc. with Dr. Um, Gail P. Myers, um, which started in 2004. And now um, he serves as the director of research and development as the head of the Legacy Seed Project for Farms to Grow. Gordon is known for growing exotic and tropical plants in cold Ohio, and he's the lead TA contract for farming and growing issues with BIPOC landholders and growers at their farms. He provides training in small businesses, farm planning, market farm services, seed saving methods, and cre uh, created a seed bank. He's a collector of rare and scarce heirloom seeds grown before World War II, um, here in the U.S. as a major as major crops. With us today, we also have um, Benita Adeb, who calls herself an extended mom, as the advisor for youth programs and farmer support programs. 
She is the founder and president of Steam Onward, Inc., a nonprofit organization in Southern Maryland, which serves as an incubator for the Ujamaa Farming Alliance. Excuse me, Ujamaa Cooperative Farming Alliance. Um, the Ujamaa Cooperative Farming Alliance is a collaborative of emergent and seasoned growers who cultivate heirloom seeds and grow culturally relevant plants for food, healing, and textiles. In addition, she works with the Cooperative Gardens Commission to distribute free heirloom seeds to communities in need, serving 300 seed hubs nationally. Ms. Adeb leads STEAM Onward, a youth development nonprofit in, in Maryland, as well as the commissioner to the Cooperative Garden, um, uh, the Cooperative Garden Commission. Um, which is a grassroots collective working towards food sovereignty in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Ms. Adeb is now retired from teaching and is, has been an educator for 37 years. Uh, we also have with us today, Michael Carter Jr., who is an 11th generation American farmer and a fifth generation, and is the fifth generation to farm on Carter's farms. His family's Century Farm in Orange County, Virginia, where he gives workshops on how to grow and market ethnic vegetables. With Virginia State University, he is the Small Farm Resource Center coordinator for the Small Farm Outreach Program. Um, and the Virginia Association of Biological Farmers and Virginia Food Shed Capital have him sit on their respective board of directors. He also serves as the state coordinator for the Black Church Food Security Network and has the food safety coordinator of the six state farm to table organization. He acquired an agricultural economics degree from North Carolina a and State University and has worked in Ghana, Kenya, and Israel as an ag agronomist and organic agricultural consultant. As a um, what is, uh, he has been a curriculum developer and program coordinator for his educational, cultural, and vocational programs. And, um, he teaches and, uh, and contributes to the Africans and African Americans to agriculture worldwide and trans and students, educators and professionals in Africa, cultural understanding, empathy, and empathy. Um, and plenty of bias recognition. And then um, I will be joining this panel as well um, uh, in conversation um, and also acting as moderator. And um, I am a first generation farmer who's on my journey of reclaiming farming landed me on a 20 acre mixed vegetable farm in rural Western Washington, where I immersed myself in small scale agricultural practices. I now serve as a board member for the National Young Farmers Coalition, which is a national advocacy network fighting for the future of agriculture for young and beginning farmers. And I'm currently working with the Organic Seed Alliance. And Uh, once again, my name is Benita Adib. I'm um, working in uh, Southern Maryland um, in unceded Piscataway and Akakeek land. And my uh, golden life is to hand seeds to people and let them become um, part of their lifestyle and independent again. So my seed story is a long one. And um, as far as um, my research goes, my family has been farming in the United States since 1710. And of course, you can imagine some of the ways we got here. But with, it goes without saying that even with the struggles and the trepidation with farming, there was always pride. Uh, I was told stories about how the people in my family, particularly the men, were able to protect 
their uh, their daughters and their wives by their success in farming, which allowed them to uh, produce enough income so that the girls did not know uh, didn't have to go out to work outside of their home. As many of you know, it was very dangerous during slavery times for uh, black children in the kitchen. And uh, it was the number one place where black children were murdered. They were beaten to death by um, the, the misses of the house in the kitchen. And so um, there are many, many stories about the dangers that were not just on the farm, but in the farmhouse for, for women and children. So in my family, the reason why this was such an important thing that the men were successful at farming is that the girls were able to stay at home and if they could have their own businesses or do what they needed to do, they were under the protection of, of the, the home. And I was told that uh, that was one of the reasons why the girls were so sweet is because they were not abused and they were treated well and kindly at home. Uh, my family is uh, from South Carolina, from Winsboro, South Carolina, which is a town uh, about uh, 30 miles north of Columbia, and from Rock Hill, South Carolina, which is a town just uh, south of Charlotte. Uh, now it's a part of a suburb of Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Uh, Catawba Reservation on one side, Cherokee on the other. And um, the stories about my family have been passed down, and I take it as a great privilege that, uh, unlike many families, the stories uh, of my ancestry go all the way back to uh, the days of slavery and to Africa. So uh, let me tell you about the seed story. I was at a funeral. The funeral was in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and my grandfather's youngest daughter was passed, had passed away. And at this funeral, there were a whole lot of people that looked like me. Well, I grew up in California. And uh, so how I got to California was because uh, after World War II, uh, one of my uncles uh, refused to follow the basic rules of Jim Crow. He wouldn't bow his head. He wouldn't say yes, I'm a no, I'm do the things he had to do to be a, a young man in the South. And so my grandparents would not let him come back uh, home. They sent him to school at Berkeley. And so um, he went to school at Berkeley and eventually my family uh, relocated to Berkeley. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why when I was in the room with all these people that looked like me, I didn't know who they were, but it came to be that there were almost 40 of them who were my mother's first cousins. My family had a whole lot of boys and a whole lot of children because they were farmers and you needed a lot of children if you were farmers. So I heard the story about this uh, successful farmers and one particular crop that they grew. And this crop was a sweet potato. I mean, it was a watermelon. So according to the story, the watermelon was so delicious and sold so well in the, in the uh, town market that uh, there was enough money made so that they were able to not just keep the girls um, at home, but also to send uh, children to college. And that was a really big deal. So uh, after a while, I began to wonder, uh, you know, what were those crops, what they're raising? And so I interviewed all uh, of my cousins that were alive. And I learned a lot about their farming practice and, and what they grew. But it wasn't until, um, just recently, when uh, I started working with Cooperative Gardens Commission, that I heard that um, Seed Savers had a program for rematriation, and they would help me get back the seeds that belonged to my family. But there was a challenge, like exactly what were those varieties? You know, um, when people talked about watermelon, a collard, a mustard green, string beans, there was no mention of the varieties. And so I went on a journey interviewing the elders. I have a cousin who's 103 that lives in Chapel Hill. And I started with her asking her about varieties. And she remembered something. She remembered a, a beautiful uh, stream bean that she described as a flat stream bean that was very sweet. 
that uh, her mother grew. And after a while, I was able to research and find that it was actually uh, aroma, a string bean. And the story, well, how did that stream bean get to be the most popular bean, you know, in, in with my family. And so there was a story about Italian immigrants who brought that bean, moved into the South, and that's how my family was able to, um, to plant that, that delicious sweet bean. But nobody remembered about this watermelon. So I finally said, um, went back to my cousin, her name is Sally, and I asked Sally, um, Sally, who might remember what the name of that, that uh, seed was? And so she told me that on our family plot in Winsboro, South Carolina, there's still family living on that plot. They're not farming 250 acres, but uh, there's still people um, living on that plot. So I found one of my cousins who was 97 years old and I asked him more and more questions about uh, what was grown and he talked about you know, the sweet potatoes and what variety. And I asked him specifically what variety of watermelon was grown. And he said, now how am I supposed to remember something that happened to me when I was a little child? And so um, I think that uh, Mel mentioned that I'm a retired school teacher. And so one of the things I did, I taught history. And one of the things we did is we had uh, oral histories it was a requirement for the kids. I also run an after school program and I ask all of the members, they have to go home and do a, a history with their parents and their grandparents, interviewing the elders about what were the plants that were most popular, most used, and whatever plants they had that were healing. So I found there was a series of questions that you could ask the elders to help bring back those memories. And so one of those questions was like, close your eyes and tell me what did the kitchen smell like? And so uh, when they would do the, you know, a little, after a little coaxing, they could remember the, the, what the smell was like in that kitchen. They could smell the sweetness. And you know, they, they always put what they call new potatoes in when they cook the stream beans. And when they cook the greens, there was always the smell of either uh, a pork, uh, uh, some kind of pork part, either bacon, or uh, there was the smell of a ham hocks or something that went in those greens. And so over a period of time asking him, well, what, what music was popular at that time? And what, um, what was uh, served for breakfast? That's a really good question. As you ask these questions, it, it appears to open up the memory of seniors. And I was able to, uh, through this process, asking him like, what color was the watermelon? Was it a icebox watermelon? Was it a, was it a big watermelon for picnics? Was it small round? Was it red or yellow? Over the course of me, asking my uncles uh, these questions, he remembered that it was the stone mountain watermelon. He remembered the stone mountain watermelon. And I can tell you that I, I'll, be, I'll tell you just, I cried because I really, really was so happy. I felt so proud that I had found this variety. So I, uh, I think it was actually Kara, Kara, you're the one that told me you would help me repatriate. So I went uh, back to my family and told my family that I had been able to uh, find this wonderful watermelon. And um, a bunch of my cousins uh, said they wanted to grow it, but they asked me to continue to do the research for my family. And um, they gave me a list of about 15 varieties that were very popular, but they wanted to know more. They wanted to learn more. And so my seed story not only took me um, to uh, Stone Mountain, you know Stone Mountain's in Georgia. If y'all know the history of Stone Mountain, there's a lot of history there. And it turned out that this watermelon was a part of a trial that was done. Um, and I heard that this trial was uh, when I believe it's the Bradford watermelon that sells for like 10 uh, 10 seeds for, for $10 came out of the same trial. So it really was a very special watermelon. And so that led me on the search for not just uh, watermelon, 
but for uh, all the important seeds in my family. So um, last year, uh, we, as a part of our work to uh, help support families who wanted to start growing again, we began to organize Black farmers. And um, Michael Carter was there in a field standing saying, you know, Benita, um, we can start growing African varieties and we can teach kids how to do it. As a matter of fact, his kids grow African varieties. And so um, upon that uh, and his promise that he would give us African varieties and help from Nate Kleiman who came from New Jersey and helped us sow the birth, uh, sorghum, we began to organize uh, black and BIPOC growers and we started out with two. First, it was Paul and Michael. Then it was uh, uh, several more. It was about seven. Then it went to 20. Then after a while, we had 50. And I think of about now, we probably have about uh, over 120 growers that are when, uh, within the collective and growing. And uh, we require that every single grower have a seed story. And this is really hard work because uh, people who are disenfranchised, who were forced to move, the, the uh, uh, Northern migration of black people had them fleeing in the middle of the night. As a matter of fact, in the 1950s, when my family left North Carolina, we fled by night. Nobody knew that we were escaping North Carolina. I was seven years old and uh, they were still afraid. It was still a secret that people were leaving. Uh, so we've lost a lot of that culture, but you know, I agree with our, our opening speaker that those stories, the seas are within us. Uh, it's important for us to know it. The path might be a little bit emotional and traumatic, but we must, we must, first of all, we must talk to our seniors and show them love and honor their knowledge. This is traditional knowledge. So when you go to your seniors and you ask them to tell you stories, you're, you're acknowledging that they know something that you don't know. That's an important thing that should be lost in, should not be lost in modern society. But the other thing you do is you open up a world of opportunity for yourself and you open the doors to your ancestors. And as you begin to call them by name, they will come to you and they will bless you in your work. So, um, We've had the opportunity to uh, develop this collection of seeds that we have identified into a seed store. And we started our own online seed company, Ujama Seeds, that was launched on January 12th. And, you know, and to the creator be the glory. And we have uh, had a successful launch and have started our way on a journey of reclaiming our heritage, stewarding those seeds taking good care of them and stewarding the skills and the traditions, the farming traditions, and then making sure that those stories are available for future generations way in the future. I used to think two generations, that's just not enough. We need to think five, six generations or more into the future to make sure that our work will never be lost again. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Bonita. Thank you so much. Um, okay, I'm going to pass the mic to Gordon and um, please share your seed story. What, what seed brought you to this, this great work? Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you may be. I am Uncle Gordon, Gordon Reed from Cincinnati, Ohio. And I, um, the seed that brought me to this spot <clears throat> is, believe it or not, a forage plant. It's not a cultivated plant. It is called shepherd's purse or shepherd's sprout or shepherd's shoot. And it's similar to uh, plants like poke salad, um, psyllium, dandelion, uh, those plants that we refer to as weeds. But uh, in the reality of what we're looking at with those, those were very critical, fresh foods for Black people, both the North and the South, uh, and because it grew freely. It grew wild. 
So you didn't have to purchase it. You just merely had to take the time to go out and find it growing. Um, uh, looking at where we found it here in Ohio, mainly it grew in cornfields. Um, and it's very, it spreads well. I'm not going to call it evasive, but it spreads quite well. And it grew along with the corn or it grew around the outside of the cornfields. Um, the reason this uh, particular plant and some of the others that are mentioned were particular to me, uh, it has great medicinal purposes. And I was using it as a child because I had gotten sick and our family doctor who was a licensed registered apothecary, he told me that's one of the plants that I needed to eat in order to reverse my illness. So to me, it's a lifesaver. Um, they grow, like I said, they grow wild and they're all over Eastern United States and the South. I'm not sure how well it's growing out West, but I do know it can get prolific and be very, very resourceful. Uh, some of the other plants that we call weeds and we spend billions of dollars annually to get rid of those weeds. At one time, many of those plants were actually food plants here in the United States. And some cases they were grown commercially, just as today the dandelion is grown commercially as is psyllium or plantain, those are grown commercially. So when we look at the seeds, we look at the seeds of forage, those that are found in the forest, and we look at what it does or what it can do, not only as far as feeding you or feeding plant your uh, animals, but the medicinal end. And too many times, a lot of plants are taking out of circulation or taking out of cultivation because there's not a large amount of production and they don't make a lot of money. Um, the thing that you need to look at is a number of these plants that we're utilizing or that we would use actually offer great health benefits. And it's not a matter of going to the drugstore to pick up some vitamins, it's easier just to have the vitamins in your home and eat them every day, you know? And, and looking at foods that we consume that are healthy foods, uh, you know, what do you take to get rid of rickets? You drink that every day. What do you do to take care of scurvy? You drink that every day for rickets, milk, cheese, for scurvy, fruit juice. And you know, the thing is, is that, well, it's just fruit juice. No, it's medicinal. And if you look at our diet, the way it's been put together by <clears throat> the USDA Nutrition Board, a lot of the foods that they have in there, yes, they're foods, but they're also medicine, healing healing properties. So, you know, what brought me on this journey is that, you know, when I got sick, plants brought me through. And if you would do some research, individual research, and go back and look at some of the writings about uh, the plants that we have, you will see that a majority of plants consumed in the United States from 1700 through the 1950s were both dual plants, food and healing. Uh, you know, when I look at the history of my family about uh, growing, uh, my family goes all the way back to the 1700s, well, to the 1500s, as far as working with plants. But these forage plants 
that I'm talking about or that I use, it only goes back to about a hundred years. And that's when folks would, you know, still forage for food. Um, we look at what we purchase in the stores. Um, how many of you all would spend three hours to go and get those same food items for free? All you have to do is put the time in to work, locate the plants, and do your own harvesting. And then you know exactly what you got. Then you would know what you're looking for. Uh, to all of the wild mushroom harvesters, I tip my hats. You know, that's, a, that's something that gives you an edge up or a foot up on your health and everybody else. Uh, when we look at what we can do um, for our own safe, safe being, and for those of our families, we need to not look at what necessarily comes off of the shelves at the grocery store, but we also need to look at what's coming out of the field at the farmer's land. And we also need to look at what nature has provided to us, you know, free of charge. So the, the shepherd's purse, the disease that I acquired when I was uh, eight years old was childhood diabetes. And at the time, the cost of insulin, my family could not afford the cost of insulin. Luckily, our family doctor was a certified registered apothecary. And what that means in medical terms is the doctor was allowed to create and sell and distribute his own medicines that he could make within his office. And so he gave to my parents a list of plants that I needed to eat in order to reverse the effects of the diabetes. And it's not something, it's not witchcraft, it's not magic. There's actually a couple of books that have been published about how to use those several plants to help reverse, and I'll say digestive problems, not just diabetes, but digestive problems. And if you do your research on your own, you will see that not only is Shepherd's Purse one of those plants, but so is Plantain or Psyllium, and also is dandelion. So, you know, looking into what we're doing with these plants or what we're not doing with these plants, I wonder how many people's health would increase you know, exponentially if they started to eat the plants that grow naturally in nature and not necessarily deal with all the plants that the farmers are growing. Because uh, all the farmers and all of the food companies are not necessarily growing food in the public's best interest, but they're growing food in the best interest of their bottom lines. Um, the seeds many times are hard to find, but when you can find them, hey, grow them and you know, spend some time in learning what those seeds are and how much they will help you. So, you know, my seed story would be shepherd's purse, it would be dandelion, it would be poke salad, it would be, you know, those types of plants. And, you know, they're not weeds. You know, you look at Joe Pye weed, it's not a weed. Um, you look at uh, nightshade, deadly nightshade, believe it or not, is actually a medicinal plant when properly used is good sedative. So there's more to a plant than what somebody tells you. It just takes some time on your part to find out what it is that the person did not tell you how a plant can be used. So, you know, going back roughly 100 years with my uh, mother's family, uh, they were still foraging. You know, they were here in Ohio. 
outside Cincinnati. Uh, they had maybe three quarters of an acre, but we're, they lived in a very wooded area and they still foraged for a lot of their food. They had a small farm, but they still foraged. My father's family had, comes from central Kentucky down Madison County. And between the family members, they probably had five or 600 acres. And they, they produced 90% of their food. And they did some other crops, you know, cash crops. They did a lot of tobacco. Uh, they did a lot of sweet potatoes. So, you know, looking at the history of black farmers or black farming, um, you know, we've got a true, true legacy there. Uh, I am the director for the Legacy Seed Project. And all of that creator is blended in with Mother Earth to create these beings. And just by, you know, the sake of this modern science, we were the last things obviously created. So we're the baby brothers and the baby sisters. We're the brats who don't necessarily appreciate the value of uh, our older brothers and older siblings. But they have so much to teach us, to show us, to share with us. You know, and they do it through these seeds. These seeds hold information for both our history, our present, and our future. And, you know, us not recognizing them and honoring them only really hampers our outlook and ultimately our lives on this planet. The more we embrace them and embody them, grow them, tell their stories, you know, retell their stories, you know, share them with our children, the better off we are and we will be. Uh, again, my, my seeds, my sons have encouraged me to start a seed company on the, their behalf to keep them engaged. And, you know, it's through those seeds in particular, I can now tell the story of the other seeds and we can all be seeds. That was kind of corny, but uh, corn is a seed, so I'm going to go with it. I love it. Oh, that's so, it's so perfect because I am holding up some Looney Dent corn. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. I, I ha I've had this in my hand. I don't know, like it just like has been calling me and you just like, you had an end on corn, perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, um, thank you so much, all of you for that. I just, you know, hearing all these different stories is, is so amazing because we all come to seed in, in very different ways. Um, so I wanna, um, my next question that I have for y'all all, since we're talking about Ujama Seed Collective is I wanna hear about Ujama Seed Collective and tell me, you know, how did that come to light? Um, tell me a little bit about um, some of the successes that y'all have had very recently with the launch of Ujama Seed Collective and, you know, how can people support you and get involved? Well, I'm going to have to throw this one back to Michael and Ira because Michael Carter told me that Ira Wallace has been trying to get this idea launched for ever. I heard the I, I've heard this story from uh, Gail Taylor and other people in the industry that Ira always believed that this was something that needed to happen. And uh, I have to go back to something my grandmother said that every cloud has a silver lining. And Ujama is the direct uh, results of COVID, the conditions that forced us to have to look at self-reliance. It forced us to have to understand that this government was not going to do right by people of color. And if we wanted to survive, we would have to find a way and relearn the skills that we lost. And what happened was some dear friends like Ira Michael and Nate uh, stepped up to help us learn the seed business. And uh, we actually had many companies, about 25 companies that came forth that said that they would support us in the standing up of a black indigenous or BIPOC seed company with a focus on culturally important seeds and seeds from the African diaspora. So uh, Iris said, well, you know, I'll be there. You can count on me. She showed up and, um, and Dear uh, brother, um, uh, Nate Kleiman says, I'll drive 
down and help you get started and we'll set up these fields. And he was already in possession of quite a bit of African stock, had been studying this. We started with what we knew uh, would be very good for growers to grow. So we started out with things like okra, things like uh, field peas or southern peas, sorghum that did not require a lot of irrigation. What we're trying to do is to wake up the spirit of farming in that's in our genes. It's in our DNA. It's in our blood. And so one of the ways to do it is to looking at food. So you right there, you got that. If anybody has ever had any kalalu, okay? You know, people came to me and said, if you're going to grow, if you're going to have stuff for uh, for the African diaspora, you got to have kalalu and scotch bonnet. So uh, from our conversations we had with senior citizens with grannies and from our support from Nate who came down, who actually helped us put culture important seeds in the ground. We got a whole bunch of seeds uh, that came from Carter uh, uh, Farms, Carter uh, Seed Store and a huge donations and support and mentoring from uh, Mama Ira and, and many others, many people that are in this room support from uh, Seed Savers, support from um, the <coughs> Organic Seed Alliance that agreed to train growers. We stepped out by faith. <coughs> we started last March. We did our soft launch for Kwanzaa, which again was Iris' idea. We need to launch for Kwanzaa, you know, and we were able to pull off a soft, soft launch by Kwanzaa. And then January 12th, we launched our seed company with the emphasis on food. Uh, why? Because you got to speak the language of your people. You know, it's like a lot of people come into a community and they try to speak, but if you're speaking Greek and everybody else is speaking Swahili, it's not going to work. So uh, many uh, people in our community, as they go about reconstructing lost heritage, often look at at a particular meal. <clears throat> what does it take to represent Kalalu, for instance? If you're going to cook that Kalalu tonight, what do you need? Well, it turns out that it's not always the same thing. And I think Michael represented, uh, he talked about the fact that, that those seeds, when they got to America, morphed and they're not always the same thing. So when we looked at interviewed the Caribbean elders because they wanted Kalalu, it turns out that there was a Suriname uh, uh, amaranth that you could use. But the Jamaicans were mad as heck because they had a black seeded uh, amaranth and nothing else could substitute. But then the people from Trinidad and Tobago and Guyana had a totally different thing. They didn't even use amaranth. They used Edo. So what we found is as we begin to uh, learn more, we found out that what our ancestors had done is that when they came to this country, based on what availability they had, they adapted foods to using the same cooking me methods and, and uh, techniques that were used. That one pot meal is everything. That's why Kalalu, uh, Chebujin is, you know, in Africa, like every country has their own Jebuchi and jollof rice, you may have heard of their own recipe that certain ingredients uh, that we need to offer that makes our work a little bit more complicated. So uh, maybe we need 50 varieties of okra. Maybe we need 200 varieties of okra in order to meet the individual needs. But as we learn and as we grow and as more farmers come aboard and take responsibility for growing out these crops, we hope to be able to meet the needs of our people we're also working with growers on the continent. We are uh, supporting them in doing the same work, being able to grow out and seek and find and, and collect and steward those, um, those unique things that are indigenous to their community. Uh, in some countries where they're wealthy or some countries where um, they, they weren't even growing African vegetables anymore. There were some countries where they had actually outlawed of the purchase of uh, heirloom seeds. And uh, although there were some other countries that wouldn't let genetically modified seeds in too, which is wonderful to know. That was a benefit for Kenyans because uh, they had noticed right away that there was a difference in seed crop and it really held the borders tight to not allow um, 
genetically modified things. I think our sister Wangari Mathai has something to do with that as an environmentalist, you know, really talked about holding on to your culture and your heritage. So we've launched with about 80 variety of seeds. We are getting ready to do a, cal a, 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 a catalog update uh, in February that will add probably another 50 or 80 variety. What I'm saying to you is if something that's near and dear to your heart, something that's important, if you have seeds, please share those seeds with us. We will be growing out um, the wild things like the stuff that Gordon met. You know, we've been harvesting uh, cress. Cress is a thing that grew wild in almost every family age in the South. Uh, also, dandelion was wine is, you know, used uh, for medicinally. Also, uh, also a uh, fruit like um, uh, beach plum and elderberry and uh, aronia. Many of these things can be grown from seed. Uh, pawpaw, persimmon, you know, as we delve and as we discover and as we hold it tight, never to let our heritage slip out of our hands again, we will add those seeds to our collection. So we wanna thank all the people who supported us. Uh, I do think I need to let uh, uh, my nephew, uh, Nate Kleiman is on this call. So I'm gonna ask my nephew, Nate Kleiman, and if my sister, Ira Wallace, would like to say a few words about the work we're doing, that would be really cool as well. And Gordon also is, uh, you know, uh, he's with our seed operations. So step forward, youngins, and say something. Oh, oh, let's see. I could say something. I am hey. so proud. Hey, I am so proud of Ujama. You know, like literally, I've been talking about for years that it's going to take something extraordinary to get more Black people, more Brown people, not just working for people who are growing seeds, but being the people leading that. And I think that, uh, as you say, it's a sad thing that it took something like COVID to make an opening big enough for black and brown people to walk through. But it took having people like you, Benita and Gordon, and all the young people that you work with, I mean, it, to make it happen. And I am saying to people on this call, if you wanna be good allies, help them succeed. When Southern Soldier was young, so many people wrote about us, shared it in their networks and help uh, what we were doing be known and we wanna pass it forward. Thank you, sister. <laughs> um, thanks, okay. Bonita. I, I, won't, I won't say much. I'm just sitting here going through uh, uh, sorghum seeds from the government that, um, that are gonna be sent out to Ujama growers this year. And uh, it's just been a, a, a real honor and a, and a thrill to work with um, so many fine people on, on this project. And, um, and uh, yeah, I, I'm just so grateful to all of you who are here and all of you who are here listening and, and um, eager to see where this goes. Much love, thanks. Thank you, Nate. Thank you, Ira. I feel like, you know, I feel like this, this story, this story is never complete without Mama Ira uh, <laughs> and her, her wisdom. She just brings so much and she's been, you know, the mother and teacher and nurturer to so many young seed stewards. And so I would love to hear from y'all, like, you know, how you see, you know, the next generation of uh, farmers, you know, stepping into this work and um, you know how young folks can get involved, and and um, yeah, like you know how you're how do you plan on sharing that knowledge, Mama Ira? You're welcome to speak, Gordon. I think we may have lost Michael. I know he was have he's might be having some connection issues. Oh, he's there, Michael. You're welcome to chime in as well. One of the things, this is Gordon, uh, one of the things that Farms to Grow has had and one of the things that I have had, whether I wanted to have it or not, is that 
when children see you digging in the dirt, they are coming over there to see what you're doing. <laughs> and that's how Uncle Gordon came about in that a lot of the kids that would come around when I was digging in any one of my gardens, uh, they would stand there to find out what I was doing. And when they would see me pull vegetables out of the soil, the amazement and wonder that they had on their faces was just, you know, beautiful. And they became servants of the soil. They wanted to look at, could they do this? How, what did they need? So, you know, the thing that happens is that you can start them out and they want to see what's going to happen next. If they put this little pebble or this little seed in some dirt or in some soil, what's it going to become in two weeks, four weeks, two months? And that is how you capture the next generation. Uh, in the summertime, when I lived in the east side of Cincinnati, during the day between the hours of 10 and 3.30, any mother or father on my street knew where their kids were. And there was one lady that came and was visiting a friend, and she happened to notice she didn't hear any of the kids playing nearby. And she asked her friend, where are they at? And she says, well, what are you talking about? I don't hear my kids. She said, oh, they're probably over at Gordon's. He's back digging in the garden. And <laughs> they, knew, they knew exactly where their kids were. If I was out there, they knew that's where they were going to come to. So that's, that's how you capture the kids. Their natural curiosity about what's going on and what's an adult doing, it's going to draw the kids right to you. Michael, you were going to say something? Yes, ma'am. Um, so we use uh, what we call Afrotourism, mm -hmm. and we use a lot of um, QR codes. So I have a whole bunch. I, I grow just as many QR codes as I do Amaris and, uh, and other things, a whole bunch of little white QR codes that, you know, allows that teen, tween, 20 something to be able to relate to the farm by utilizing the technology they're already familiar with. And that's, uh, that's been very engaging for a lot of young people to kind of remember and stay engaged and also helps me by hits to my website. Uh, <laughs> but they can always go back to it and, and learn a little bit more about those crops. Uh, another great thing that I try to use in my farm is hemp. Hemp is the gateway plant <laughs> to children. And, you know, Right, it's legal in Virginia to grow it. Uh, so we have a hemp license. And, you know, because of its similarities to marijuana, especially in August through like October, with the smell and the flowering, young people are very much engaged. They want to take pictures by it. They want to be seen with it, knowing that it's legal, but looking like you're a kingpin of sorts. And we play to those realities, and, and that becomes our gateway to explain to them, you know, how microgreens work, how seeds work, how seed sales work you know, how hemp works in terms of its sale and its marketing. Uh, because we, we're, we're developing a curriculum to really work with young people, usually African-Americans between ages like 16 to 25. But that's, those are usually the individuals that are left out. Those are the ones on the corners. Those are the ones, you know, committing, you know, various, you know, I won't say crimes, but definitely out a lot of times. Um, the children usually stay engaged, but as soon as they hit puberty, it's tougher to keep them. So we try to engage them in this way through um, multicultural, and cultural, but um, rice of passage programs uh, to keep them kind of engaged and then showing them how to make money on the farm. If you don't know how to earn an income in a vocation, then it doesn't, it's not going to be appealing. That's why I never wanted to be a farmer because my uncle would say, I'm not making any money. You hear that year after year after year, it's like, why do you even do this? I want to show them my tax return and say, okay, this is what I made on my farm. This is how much I made by doing it. This is the amount of time it took me. So I, this is how much I made per hour. You know, and if you get good at it, I'm sure you can just sit on a phone call all day and get 250 to $500 an hour or more to be able to teach about some of these crops. And then it becomes intriguing to them. 
because now they can see or at least put a pattern or uh, idea together about how do you earn income on the farm. Because before I had no idea whether you go to farmer's markets, that means you only make money once a week. You know, do you go to the, the slaughterhouse if you got, you know, livestock or, you know, make money once a year, once every other year, every couple of months? Or can you figure out how to do it on a daily basis? Because young people at the end of the day want to learn how to, want to know how to make money. That's why we go to college. That's why we go to good jobs to try to support ourselves and make money. And if I can show you how to make money and grow your own money, you're much more engaged and continue to do it. Thanks. And uh, that's so true. And that's uh, one of the reasons I got a good old sister to me. I'm a queen is here. And, and what he says is true. Do all that work and not make money. So to me, why don't you tell them about uh, value added and some of the ways that we're trying to increase the income of farmers. Um, so in addition to, hi everyone. <laughs> Um, in addition to um, being a seed grower, um, I'm actually one of the co-leads of the Value Added Working Group for uh, the Ujama Collective, uh, a cooperative. Um, so we look at a number of products that people have to offer who are, who are farm-based or that um, go well with our mission and our philosophies. Um, the information form that Nate put in the chat is the initial intake. Um, if you have something that you'd like to try to add to the Ujamaa Collective's uh, value added product list, that's a separate form, um, but everybody will need to fill out the first intake form for uh, first, which I believe has questions on it about value added. Uh, and then I send you a value added um, intake, or you can always uh, email me directly and say, hey, you know, can you send me the form? Um, so, you know, the thing about being a farmer of any kind is we all need to, you know, off, there's always an off season, you know, whichever way that you're, you're growing. And so it's really important to make sure that our producers have a way to continue earning income in the winter months or in their off season um, using stuff that they're already, you know, they're already managing on their property. For instance, you know, I, I do livestock as well as seed and organic vegetables. So, you know, compost teas and things like that are, are a part of our value added products. So, you know, we try to give a, a, a an avenue for growers to be able to um, make money from those, those side products through an online e-commerce situation in addition to their local um, market. And somebody thinks to me, if somebody asks about getting older people um, growing, and I'll tell you one of the things that gets a lot of older people excited. Now, don't, don't laugh at this, but older people love collard greens. And we did not really hit you hard on the heirloom collard project. But what we found out is when you talk about foods that are culturally important, all of a sudden, it's a lot more relevant and a lot more about them. And grandma. So I think we're, we're doing a, another uh, panel on, on collards. Come and see uh, some of our collard stories. But if the, if the work is relevant, if it's important, if it's something uh, that touches the heartstrings, then people will, are more likely to invest in it. The other thing we have going for them is people can't go to the club like they used to. They can't even go to the Super Bowl like they used to. People are spending more time at home. And once they learn the benefits of growing and being outside and they get the, the fruits of their labor, you know, when they see those beautiful peppers, you know, when you see that, you know, whatever it is you love, be it a, a, um, a Tabasco cayenne pepper cum, or if it's, you know, um, uh, a scotch bonnet or, you know, that the ping pong, we got these beautiful pink tomatoes, this tropical tomato that is so gorgeous. When you see something, it means something to you, then you go out of your way. I also need to, to see, I see my sister, Sister Mary Kay is here, and we are standing on the shoulders of co-op gardens. And I must throw it out. If it was not for co-op gardens, I would not have learned the spiritual nature of seeds. I was taught that through the wonderful people, 2000 commissioners who gave their time and their life to help their neighbors and friends. So Mary Kay, just tell them a little bit 
about the work that Co-op Gardens has done and how we've been able to touch hearts through that work. You're on mute, there you go. Hi, thank you. Um, first, thanks Benita for sharing your story. It's always captivating to hear you speak and um, provide background and share about projects that you're working on. It's wonderful to hear from everybody on the panel today. Um, Cooperative Gardens started off in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we, uh, it was like Benita said, um, thousands of people responded to a post that Nate put out on Experimental Farm Network um, about the Victory Gardens. And uh, in our generation, we've worked really hard to be more open-minded and conscientious and responsive in the spirit of mutual aid. And uh, so right away, we didn't, we didn't call it that. Uh, we chose to call it um, the Cooperative Gardens Commission because of the history in World War II of the internment of Japanese American farmers and how um, the country needed to fire back up the, uh, the, the Victory Gardens national campaign to get people empowered to grow their own food. But it, it was successful in the sense that a lot of people did and they moved together in a good way, but they didn't all realize in all parts of the country that it was covering up this terrible thing. Um, but we know that now, and that's one of the important things about learning from history with eyes open and hearts open. Um, so CGC has continued on, we're into our third year, but in our first year, uh, we were able to allocate seeds from over 50, I believe it was over 50 seed companies, small scale seed companies and Johnny's and, and then redistribute them to 247 seed hubs around the United States into Canada. And I think we got some out, um, I think we were able to share some even further. Um, in our second year, we were able to ship seeds to 305 seed hubs and Ujama by then was going, Benito was going really um, effectively, and I, if I understand this correctly, you'd already begun the work of allocating culturally relevant seeds to over 100 seed hubs um, directly. Um, so Ujama has carried that part of the work that we've tried to do forward. We had this question in our seed hub application, which is open right now on coopgardens.org. Um, we do have the question about asking folks if there's seeds that they want that are special to them but we realized pretty quickly that we weren't able to source many of the seeds that people were asking for. Um, did, I, did I cover it, Benita? I think you did. And I think the most important thing is that if you see us standing tall, it's because we're standing on the shoulders of not just our ancestors, but our own mentors, you know, Ira Wallace, Leah Pennyman, you know, uh, these folks, they're wise, you know, beyond their years. And um, I must tell you that there's a lot of positive energy and synergy around this work. And, uh, you know, if you need me, you know, to help motivate some of your elders, we can. Uh, we first, when we first started doing this, some senior citizen says, you're not going to turn me into slaves again. We had some middle school kids say that. You're not going to make me work in the field and turn me into mm -hmm. slaves again. But here's the deal. Y'all want to eat? <laughs> Everybody's got to eat. And I don't think they understood the importance of what we do. You know, everything you you sit, everything you wear, they don't really understand the broadness of agriculture. So um, Steve Mommer, which is the uh, fiduciary for Ujama Farms, we have uh, worked on trying to educate people about the opportunities in agriculture, how broad they are. And it's not just farming, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of work. We have kids that are working on winnowing machines, that are working on um, seed cleaning machines, that are working on uh, uh, other devices to make low cost materials available to small growers. So we have uh, one of our uh, young folks design all our labeling and our packaging. This is done by a, a one of our formerly high school kids that helped to start our, our seed business who's now a sophomore in college. So yeah, the, that work um, 
our label was designed by one of our youth who is now in college who who plans to be a um a health manager she's studying uh uh, University of Maryland. She's been very interested in nutrition. Her her background is from Thailand, and uh, kids from Thailand can name their healing foods. I mean, it, they know their culture, but for many of us Americans, we've lost touch. We can't tell you, you know, what root is good or what you can get for your stomach that's out there in the backyard. You know, we've lost that. And so as we reclaim our history, I think it's motivating, I think it's exciting, and I think it's a source of pride. And the way we package it, you know, uh, my husband studied marketing, he says, the packaging is 50%. So by packaging the stories in a way that uh, excites people, that encourages people, that, uh, it, you know, that makes people feel good and makes people believe that it's worth their time uh, it's good for them and for uh, generations to come. I, I don't think it's that hard to uh, to motivate people, uh, but it, you know it's a job that has to be done regardless. So let's get about the business of doing it. Yeah. Find your seed story. That uh, root in the backyard that's good for the upset stomach is mint. Oh. Got mint in the backyard, make some mint tea. That'll help soothe your stomach. Mm -hmm. yes, right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Abba, how are we doing on time here? Yeah, we're just about at the end here. If you guys want to do anything, um, any yeah. final thoughts? I just, I, I did really have want... one thing I wanted to do, uh, Melanie. Yes. And I'm going to ask everybody to take a pledge that they will go and try to find their own seed stories, that they will find the oldest people in their family. And, and write down those stories and value them and let those people know that their memories and their knowledge is important to you. So uh, I need a show of hands for everybody who's gonna take the pledge to find their own seed stories. I got a few. Here they go, find your story. Yes, yes. Yes, your story is as important as anybody's story. And listen, y'all, Bonita is a former teacher, so she will be asking for you report facts. Okay. <laughs> oh, you found me out, huh? Okay. <laughs> I found her out. <laughs> okay, do it. I see some of y'all. Y'all better go find those C stories. I mean it. <laughs> I also want right, to just remind everyone that later this week, I popped in the chat, we are going to have a BIPOC session. Um, and this is going to be like an informal session for um, folks of the BIPOC diasporas um, to come and join and just share in our various seed stories. This is a, um, an affinity group. Um, so we do ask for, you know, non-BIPOC members to please respect our space. Um, and let us have a, a chance to gather. So I invite you all to that later this week. I popped it in the chat and you can see it also in the, um, the network under events. Um, okay, so there was one, one final question is where can we find memory questions? Uh, if you uh, Google oral histories, so um, the people who are in this work are the people who are doing like history fairs and they have a set of questions that you can go through. They probably won't deal with smells and tastes and sounds and music because those are really culturally uh, uh, relevant things. And usually they forget to do those things. But anything that hits the, the five you know, senses, they help to trigger the memory just like the ABC song was the first thing you learned in school. Mm -hmm. So if there's a tune of what song was popular during that era when you were doing it, those kinds of things tap into the brain at another place. Go for it. Thank you so much. I just want to thank everyone who um, spoke today and shared their, their knowledge and wisdom. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, also reminder, uh, Bonita is going to be speaking again. Um, and Mama Ira um, during the heirloom collar session, which is also later this week. Tune into that. Um, and uh, I just hope to see y'all all around and um, finding your own seed stories. And um, 
Again, please order seeds from Ujama Seeds. Tell all your friends and family about Ujama Seeds and tell them to order seeds, share seeds, grow seeds, save seeds, and all things seedy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Melody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Tamia. Thank you, Bonita. Thank you, Mama Ira. And, and there's one person I'm missing. That's a Nate. Oh, thank you, Nate. And there was one other person. One other, Mary, Mary Kay. Thank Mary you, Mary Kay. Kay. <laughs> yes. All right, everybody, please have a wonderful day. Please enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, and, you know, um, please tune in to some of the other sessions that some of these wonderful panelists are going to be speaking on this week as well.